in the text of the Quran, the book of scripture of the Muslims, in a chapter called Surah An Nahal, the chapter of the bee, in verse 36, Almighty Allah reveals to us, and certainly we sent to every nation a messenger saying, Worship Allah and avoid false deities. Of the people were some whom Allah guided, and of them were those upon whom error was decreed. So travel through the earth and see what was the end of those who denied the truth. In this verse, we see a text that gives us an understanding shared by Muslims all over the planet. That prophets came to Asia, to Africa, to Europe and the Americas. And we learn from the original sources of Islam that what was common in the early peoples of the planet was the concept of Tawheed, the concept of unity and the oneness of God. In Mandarin Chinese, the people express this Tawheed by saying Shang-Ti, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Akhenaten of ancient Egypt taught the belief in one God. Many say that he was teaching about the power behind the sun and he created a revolution in ancient Egypt. In Africa, all throughout the African continent, the concept of the great cosmic spirit was shared by every nation. In Burundi, the people of Burundi, in speaking about God, say Imana. When they speak about the attributes of God, they say Bisabwe, He alone is worthy of worship. They also say Habimana, only He truly exists. Habonimana, only He does as He wills. The Akan of West Africa know God as He who knows or sees all things. The Yoruba of West Africa say, only God is wise. The Bakongo of Central Africa say, he is made by no other and no one beyond him is. In Southern Africa we find the Zulu nation who refer to the Creator as Umdali. The Kosa people of Southern Africa say Qamata and they add Katayi or Umdali and it becomes Qamata Katayi which means in Arabic Allahu Akbar. God is the greatest and over everything. The Sutu people in the south say Ramasedi, which means he from whom comes light. In the Americas, there are strong references about the Cherokee nation, a strong nation of people who had large cities with over 100,000 people. And they were known for their strong belief in the great spirit. Information has come to us that from the texts or the oral traditions of the elders, when the Cherokees would begin their prayers, they would say, Ya Allah. And so we find in the Aboriginal people in Australia, in South America, in Europe, and throughout the world, the concept of Tawheed is found everywhere. So when the last Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, appeared, he did not bring a new religion, but he brought out of the people what already existed in them, and that is Tawheed. He was the seal of the Prophets, the finality of the messengers. And it is reported during his last major sermon in Arafah, he brought to the people a strong message of the oneness of God. He also spoke to them and brought them the understanding that there should be no more economic oppression and that usury and interest is cancelled. He confirmed the rights of women. He broke down the roots of racism. And he established 
the Qur'an and the Sunnah, his way and his tradition, as the keys to success. He sent his followers in all directions. And it is reported that most of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum ajma'een, died outside of Arabia. When we look at history, we find that no other religion, no other ideology, no conquering general, no people spread so rapidly and so far. Within 100 years, Islam had reached the Atlantic Ocean on the west and China and the Pacific in the east. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, brought a message that was so clear and was so simple to the people that they were able to grasp this oneness. They were able to relate to the prophets and messengers who had come from the beginning of time. And so Islam spread rapidly and people of all colors, of all nationalities, embraced this religion from the sixth century. People of all classes, the rich and the poor, male and female, came into this faith in large numbers and Islam established itself, not only in Arabia, but it established itself in Asia, in Africa, in Europe, and we also have proof that it was even in the Americas. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Verily Allah showed me the expanses of the earth. I saw the east and the west, and he informed me that the possessions of my nation would reach as far as I saw. And so the Muslims left the Arabian Peninsula and continued to travel deep into the east and deep into the west. They went into the north and deep down into the south. Islam spread so rapidly within 100 years that historians up until today are baffled at how human beings could carry a message through so many different climates and through so many different nations. But if we look at the divine uh, purpose, if we look at the essence of what was really happening, the fact is, behind this, we can see how it is very logical that Islam could have spread. Number one, in the concept of Tawheed that the Muslims were carrying, the focus was always upon unity. The focus was, was upon inclusion. And when Tawheed is being used, it refers not only to the oneness of God, but also the oneness of humanity, that we are all from one human family. Tawheed also includes the oneness or the unity of knowledge. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was reported to have said, knowledge is the lost property of the believer. Anywhere he finds it, he is the most deserving of it. And so with this, Muslims benefited from the knowledge of the ancient Egyptians, of the ancient Assyrians, the ancient Indians and the ancient Chinese, the ancient Europeans. They brought together knowledge from all over the planet Earth. Another issue of importance is the very nature of the language they were speaking and the language of the final revelation. The Arabic language is a language that is structured in such a way that it has an enormous vocabulary. And when we speak about many basic concepts, there are many ways to express yourself. Arabic also gives the speaker the ability to use the throat, the palate, um, all parts of the mouth. So when the Arabs left the Arabian Peninsula, they were able to learn languages rapidly because the whole of their mouth and their throats and every part of their speaking organ was usable. Another issue that affects the rapid spread of Islam is the Arabian horse. The Arabian steed is the fastest horse in the world. 
not only was it a fast horse, but also it is a high-spirited horse. And it gave Muslims the ability to travel long distances in a short period of time. Another important animal was the camel. With the camel, Muslims were able to cross vast deserts and able to reach lands that were almost impossible to reach in the past. Along with this, the Arabs had mastered the seas. It is reported by historians that one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Uqba ibn Nafi'a, radiallahu an, reached the Atlantic Ocean, and when he reached the ocean, he looked across. And he said, if I knew there was land across you, I would take this message. He also went south, and he reached Lake Chad. The Muslims went down into the East African coast. They found a base of operations called Maqad Shah. It was the base of the Persian emperor. And so they called it Mogadishu. They came into in a set of islands where the moon was very bright. And so they call them Juzo Al-Qamar, the islands of the moon. And now we know Juzo Al-Qamar as Comoros Islands. Musa ibn Baig developed a colony on the East African coast. And so Musa ibn Baig becomes Mozambique. Yusuf Ali develops a colony and Yusuf Ali becomes Sofala. The Arabs went into the Indian Ocean and using the Dao, they were moving their boats with what they called Habal. And Habal today is the cable. They used the astrolabes. And when they came into the Indian Ocean, they found a season of rains, a mosim of great rains. So mosim becomes monsoons. They wrote books of information, travel guides to help people in the seas and they called it Almanach. Today we call it Almanacs. They continued on and Arabic began to spread and influence people so much that by the year 1930, Walt Taylor recorded approximately 1,000 words in the English language of Arabic origin. This was in his book, Arabic Words in English. Muslims made a profound impact on the world for over a thousand years between the 7th and the 17th century. One of the strangest reports is a book describing the earth, describing different continents. It was written in the year 820 AD. The author of this text was Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khawarizmi. He set up a series of maps. One of the maps contained the Indian Ocean, and another, surprisingly enough, contained the Pacific Ocean. The Arabic writing on the top reads as follows. It says, this map shows a large area of land surrounded by dark, stormy seas. You don't know its beginning from its end. Actually, Al-Khawarizmi was writing about Australia. And this is the oldest map of Australia in existence. It is now in the Strasbourg Library in Europe. And by the 10th century, another famous map maker, Abu Ishaq al-Farisi al-Istikhari, in the year 934, had drawn a map showing not only the details of the north coast of Australia, but he also showed details of Japan between Kobe and Tokyo. To add to this, even the ancient Aboriginal people of Australia recorded the journeys of early Arab merchants. And we find writings drawn by Aboriginal people in Australia that show two masted Arab dhows in caves on the Stanley Island in Princess Charlotte Bay. This is in the northern, uh, northern Queensland in Australia. 
And so Muslims were able to travel to many parts of the planet. Information has even come to the surface that Muslims traveled across the Pacific Ocean. And they were able to reach islands, a set of islands, where there was a lot of wind. And so, according to the findings of a Harvard University professor, they called these islands Juzza al-Hawa. It was the island of a lot of wind. And so Juzza al-Hawa becomes Hawaii. They find pearls in one of the islands. And in Arabic, the word for pearl is lu'lu. In some pronunciations, lulu. And so on the map, it points and it says, Huna Lulu. Today we say, Honolulu. It is shocking to find in ancient maps so many Arabic words. Even in the United States, we find the word Mecca and Medina used over and over again. On one journey, we descended into the southern part of California. And we found a city called Mecca, California. And it had beautiful date palm trees and it had some relics and, and some uh, evidence of the presence of Muslims and Arabic speaking people. But the people were gone and the relics and the name remained. Similarly, we find along the coastlines in Central America, we find Arabic names we find the presence of Muslims coming from West Africa. When we travel into Brazil, we find the presence of Muslims. We find words like Rasif, meaning uh, a coast or a sidewalk being used in Brazil and Arabic names. We find even in the Caribbean region, a group of people who related to themselves as being uh, Arabic speaking people who came from the coast of West Africa. And so in many parts of the world, we find the presence of Muslims and Arabic speaking people. This is a shock for many historians because people are still caught up with what appeared to be the fact that Christopher Columbus discovered America. Our reality is something very different. Christopher Columbus bumped into America on his way to India. And it is reported in his memoirs that he intended to meet the great Khan of India. His navigator, Rodrigo de Triana, could speak the Arabic language. He expected to meet the great Khan. And he bumped into a set of islands and his son eventually went on to the mainland. And what happened after that was a genocide. We would like to look at history, not only from the point of view of Europe, but from the point of view of all of the peoples of this planet. These are some of the untold stories from world history. These are some of the gems of wisdom that we pray will bring about a world of peace and understanding.